Now I gotta go check the YouTube. This has never happened before. Uh, my stream apparently has shut down unexpectedly. I was saying that we're Kenless again, which is always sad. Everybody complains when, when Ken's not here, but Ken does, you know, he does do interesting, fun things on Fridays sometimes. Not me. I'm always here. Not, that's not true too. I, I do take vacations, but, uh, Ken is at a cool conference today. So maybe he'll be back next week. Um, what do we have for this week's ZDTV? We have a user spotlight. We're going to be talking to Cloud Underground and see what exactly they're doing with OpenZD, how they found OpenZD. Uh, these are some of my favorite conversations. I just enjoy talking to people in general. Uh, and I like to see when people are using the technology, various technologies, what they're up to. So why don't we just go ahead? Oh, there's no release notes to be read either. So we'll just go ahead and jump right in and bring some people in. Let's say hi to Joe. Hi, Joe. Hello. And we have uh, Laura and Nato. Hi, everybody. Hello. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks oh, for having uh, us. Oh, like I yeah, of course. I, I really do enjoy talking to people. Thank you guys for coming and, uh, you know, being on ZDTV as well. So... Uh, one of the things we generally do when we do a user spotlight is we get a little background about, you know, what the person is and, and what they're here and why they're here and that sort of stuff. So uh, who wants to talk to me about what Cloud Underground is and what Cloud Underground does? Sure, I can kick that off a little bit. Uh, cloud Underground yes. is a, we're a venture capital firm and a cloud asset management company, essentially. And so we have developed a, a platform management solution that we use with our slate of um, venture uh, of, of funded companies, essentially. Uh, so we basically help businesses uh, get funding and build out their business processes and systems using our platform. So that's kind of in, oh, cool. a, in a nutshell what we do. One of the things about that is so we have a community where we build everything that we create in, as open source. And so we open source what we research nice. and build. And that's how we discovered uh, ZD, where we also uh, have been doing a lot of work with Joe and Joe's company. Uh, and so Joe knows a ton about Zero Trust. So we've been tr getting more and more and more into Zero Trust and then started talking to Joe and all this other stuff. So uh, within our community, we heard about Open ZD from Joe because then we're adding, you know, new networking technologies and stuff. So then the next thing we know, we're building open ZD networks. And so that's, yeah. that's kind of what brought us here. <laughs> well, that's super cool. And Joe, uh, Nato mentioned your company. What is, what does your company do? Obviously zero trust consultancy type stuff. Yeah, that's correct. I've uh, definitely tried to focus more on the zero trust strategy and uh, technical implementations of, uh, you know, the solution solutions from net foundry. So young security is um, my cybersecurity and information assurance firm. I started it at the height of the pandemic in about 2021, I think it was. And so I've been CTO, IT operations manager, director, security infrastructure, chief engineer, senior software developer, senior systems and platform engineer. And so now currently what I'm doing is I'm taking all that, the many years of experience in providing tailored zero trust strategies. And the way I'm approaching this first is using the proven four design principles and five step methodology from John Kinnervog and uh, utilizing the zero trust network architecture solutions with you guys from NetFoundry. So the way it works with Underground Ops is as a strategic partnership, I assist with their DevSecOps design, development, uh, application security, cybersecurity, IT program management. Uh, I do project management with them, uh, help out with operations and mentoring their community of, what is it guys? I think we have around 300 folks in there. Yeah. Yep, yep. We have yep. a professional community nice. uh, called the DevSecOps Dojo. And uh, <laughs> Underground Ops that uh, Joe was referring to as well is our kind of sister company that is yep. our consultant MSP side of uh, Cloud Underground. So, and so uh, cool. we, we build services. And then, yes, so the technologies we build, we build services around those technologies. So we fund open source projects and research and development. And then that gets built. And then Underground Ops builds and delivers services with those. And so then, uh, yep. you know, people can get get managed services <laughs> for all kinds yeah, of yeah i mean i mean that's uh the similar to what net foundry does with open zd right we have this offering we call cloud zd and uh i have been in a position before where i've been a manager of software engineers and it's a lot of times way easier and better for my company if i can buy a particular service as opposed to having my 
you know, engineers, my people, do something that is not our core competency, right? So if your core competency might not be uh, zero trust network maintenance, then, you, you know, you can buy OpenZD, which sounds like exactly what Cloud Underground is doing in Underground Ops. So that's, uh, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, so how did, uh, I, now I know how NATO and Laura found OpenZD through Joe. Joe, how did you find OpenZD? So uh, I would say ZD discovered me. I didn't uh, discover it. Actually, it was about uh, February 2023 uh, when you guys from NetFoundry reached out to me, uh, Philip specifically, uh, I believe in business. It's always Philip. It is. (laughs) And yeah, uh, yeah, Philip's fantastic. And it took me a few months to uh, really dig in and understand OpenZD because, of course, I've been trying to push zero trust from different uh, perspectives for quite some time and running into a lot of resistance, being told it's not even a thing. And uh, a lot of solutions come along and, uh, well, it, in Philip's description, uh, they're they're not, uh, how does it, fully realized magic, <laughs> if you will. Um, yeah. He's got a great analogy for it using Harry Potter, but um, it took me quite some time. I would say at least three months to really dig into the documentation and, uh, you know, see that this is actually something quite quite interesting. Um, So after starting that initial research into OpenZD, I was already assisting the underground ops team in research on other zero trust strategies. Um, So as we discovered limitations in those different solutions, it became more clear, more apparent to me that OpenZD was a bit more diverse, more capable. And what really stood out to me was the fact it's a full featured open source solution that's massive. That's a massive plus for us. so when other solutions really couldn't meet those requirements, it fueled a lot more interest in OpenZD for us. Was there uh, was there one particular part of OpenZD that uh, and and your journey sounds similar to a lot of people, particularly when you're first starting out with zero trust? The paradigms are uh, not difficult to grasp in singular. But when you try to apply them all together, oftentimes I think it becomes overwhelming for a lot of people. It's all, it's a bunch of new stuff. So yeah. you were familiar with Zero Trust already, which is great. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. I, I started my journey with Zero Trust about, f- let's say, six years ago, five years ago. Um, and it was relatively, it was, it was a term that was out there, but it was still pretty new. And it's still kind of pretty new in a yeah. lot of ways. Uh, but boy, you can't you can't go to the internet without finding some company that's pr- professing zero trust. Now, it's becoming um, it's becoming a term, you know. So so was there one was there one part of ZD that brought you to it that you like? You, open source obviously is a great thing, right? Like I, I think all of us sounds like big proponents of open source. Absolutely. That's a huge part of Open ZD. But was there something about Open ZD itself that that brought you there and said, "Man, this is for me"? NATO, yeah, you sound like you you got. <laughs> Yeah, so we we have some um, some a lot of our goals are just we have some complex goals. One of them is we started a, like a, a few years back. We started training like satellite engineers, and then that kicked off a whole bunch of other things. Where then we started having a bunch of like satellite prototypes. And one of the things that I ran into is for people who develop satellite technologies, like managing your assets and then you know making sure that you can keep everything networked or if something happens to it being able to like control what's going on with your like assets once in orbit it can become a little bit of a nightmare and then the availability of those assets can be a nightmare too so what we started working on was uh, basically a better way for satellite engineers to be able to develop their systems where it works with mission control where it's easier to keep track of those those satellites like whether you're losing connectivity from something, whether they're going through like jamming in some region or who knows what, where it's easier to just keep connectivity with your your satellite systems. And so I was trying to find something that would work with like the, the three node system. And then you guys have this edge routing system and across like all the things that we work with, it's like you need something simple, something that you can put like on a continuous line so that you have like a strong mission control, like whether it's like fiber or something along those lines or whatever's hosting uh, what what all the nodes in orbit are talking to. So that use case, because it was so complicated to figure out like, okay, well, what's something that from, from a cost standpoint is going to make sense? Because you don't want to like send licensing out into orbit where, where there's it's like prone to change because satellites will be out there for like 20 years 
to, I don't know if anyone knows this, but to get a satellite out of orbit, you have to either just send out something that knocks it into orbit to burn, or it has to like have its sensor systems go off so that it like falls and then burns into orbit, things like that. <laughs> so, you know, we, yeah, we're, we, we have like things like space junk initiatives for like cleaning up space and orbit. So, <laughs> Cause we were talking the, the people around our, our market anyways. So space was a, a driving thing that was like, well, we got to, we have to find something that's going to coincide with our goals for that. And then we, we've been building uh, stuff for satellite offices with the technology as a way of testing the consistency of the technology. So mm. we started building appliances with ZD to kind of, kind of start getting used to it. <laughs> yeah. So that's been our, our so, newest initiative is, is building some, is building servers with uh, ZD in them as well. Yeah. yeah. Really cool. So uh, is it like a little box that you ship to people then? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. much. And just they like just plug server. it into the internet and it, and then there's ubiquitous connectivity just because well, of the way ZD works. The idea is, is if you, if you have a bunch of remote workers or a bunch of offices and they're not all connected, yep. boom, now you can just have a, a one network that lets everything talk. And like, let's That's say exactly that right. you see networks like Chick-fil-A and stuff like that, where they have like a huge edge presence for, you know, they use edge compute for all their different Chick-fil-A's and stuff like that from like a technical yeah. engineering standpoint. Well, you can achieve those same kinds of outcomes. Just like if you have a whole bunch of offices or a whole bunch of own homes, toss up little edge routers and then boom, now everyone's in one data center like you have an office. Yeah, so send everyone <laughs> that works for you one of our servers and you've got a whole... <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, that makes makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, and you guys are, uh, what do you build that on? What, what's the server look like? Is it like, um, what are the routers there? The I can't think of the open source router that we use, that we build our technology into at the moment. I'm going to look, have to go look at that up. I bet you Ken yeah. would know that right off the head. We, we actually open build on open WRT. That's what it is. <laughs> oh, sure, sure, sure. We actually build on top of like NAS architectures just because one of the oh, things yeah? that we try to make highly available is like uh, people's backup systems, uh, sure. people's yeah. uh, like S3 buckets, giving people the option to like keep your sensitive storage like out of public cloud where you can have public cloud hold like general like applications, load balancing resources, but what if you want to start keeping like your more sensitive stuff away from the public cloud, things like that. So it's it's really just like a NAS. And then, you know, one might have seven terabytes with a RAID that has hot swappable drives so that if one goes down then you just pop out this drive and then your your engineering work is not toast. So it's it's all about resilience so that people can just like work away without worrying about like data loss or like, if you get hit by malware, you got backups right there. If you get like do the wrong thing, you got backups right there. And then it's easy to restore because we use we use infrastructure as code for everything. And so then everything just mm -hmm. restores as like infrastructure as code and snapshots. So it's like a jellyfish if it like loses its arm, it just it's just like grows back. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, that sounds really that sounds really neat and exciting. I I mean I saw you had a post on LinkedIn in a spacesuit, which I thought was cool. <laughs> I look forward to the I, I look forward to the next one where you know where you're talking about whatever this appliance is. Uh, I can only imagine what the what the outfit will look like for that. <laughs> appliances. Well, that's cool. Future. So so. Uh, so when you're using OpenZD, uh, have there been any particular challenges that have hit you that were uh, either things that ZD solved for you, and we know the ubiquitous connectivity one, or that were maybe bump, bumps in the road, things that you had to get through in order to, to uh, you know, better grok the technology? I mean, I think the biggest one is just like, if you see like a typo in, in, the, in the source, but other than that, like it seems to just work. I'm sure it has <laughs> like things that are, would be a challenge, but for the most part, we've we've worked with so many things that, to to be honest, it's it's something that so far the configurations work as expected with with minimal tinkering. Uh, and we've been mm -hmm. looking for something that follows like the three node theme, and so setting up like an edge router in the cloud, and then having all of the like land based hosts, it just it just works. I don't know. <laughs> so far, it nice. just works. <laughs> Well, good. Well, let's hope it continues to work. I'm sure. I'm sure it'll be just fine. What, what uh, hitches so have what you run you? into, Joe? I'm sorry. What hit, what hitches have you run into? Well, I'd, I'd like to echo you and say that uh, as far as 
technical challenges goes using the, the overlay functionality with what we're trying to do to protect compute and storage has been, it's been pretty seamless. There hasn't been many issues. Most of the challenges that I see we run into are not actually technical and there's overall industry challenges. You know, we're breaking down silos with zero trust for breach prevention as a strategy. And, you know, where zero trust strategy leverages this technology, trying to enable it so that the technology doesn't get in the way of business outcomes and trying to also, you know, here we are, but trying to make sure that the strategy stays as vendor agnostic as possible. So these are, you know, I would say bigger challenges than technical issues or, you know, technical challenges we run into. Um, the biggest I find by far is the, t the challenge of not falling into the trap and believing that we should not trust people or the, the line is that people are the weakest link. So, you know, I, I firmly believe that we should be trusting people. That it's the most critical thing we can do. Uh, trusting people is what fuels business outcomes. Teams require that trust in order to be successful. And Zero Trust focuses on removing trust relationships from digital systems, not people. So because of that trust relationship between the digital systems that these threat actors are exploiting. So it's trust that makes all human relationships possible and it's what achieves business outcomes. So we can't really stop trusting people or rely on this line that people are the weakest link when people are the only link. So, yeah. yeah in fact, I, I, I would say it a little differently because um, uh, this is a line I've used before. The term mm -hmm. zero trust is just a terrible, it, it, it is not what it's it's almost like an anti definition of what it really means when sure. we're talking about a zero trust overlay network we're really talking about explicit trust you you definitely know who or what device is talking to what other service or device right so there's very explicit trust and the no trust mm -hmm. in zero trust really comes around from uh, you know don't just trust that the network is going to be safe and secure always, always, always verify. So right. uh, trusting people is also really important and you have to establish that trust. Mm -hmm. Just like, uh, you know, when you're building a, a friend relationship, you know, at first you're just acquaintances, you know, you don't know the person and then eventually through their actions, you, you build that trust and now there's somebody that you actually can rely on. We're just doing that digitally with these strong identities. And so uh, I, I, I do think the term zero trust is kind of a, like a, I'd love to find a better term for it. I, 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 I oftentimes will refer to explicit trust instead, but the term, the buzz term is zero trust. It's a matter of perspective, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really is. It's a matter of perspective, and people have different perspectives on it and approach it from different ways, uh, soft and you know technical. And it's so there should be no trusted identities. And this is something that you know I, I have heard you use before, Clint. Uh, the, the, the term trusted identities and, and there must only be identities and although you know we speak about strong identities but the key word there that you use is, is actually verification we can have zero trust and we can call it zero trust because we aren't trusting these digital systems we're trusting people but not their packets the, the identities are strong but what if these identities get stolen like in the case we had recently with microsoft's breach of the 38 terabytes of private ai data that was a SaaS token. That. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what would be considered a strong identity. However, it was misconfigured with way too much trust and exploited. So it's not just. Well, so that, know, that, that goes back to those four pillars of zero trust of least privilege, right? There so you go. So you're, we're saying, back, totally. you're saying we're back to not trusting and, and having zero trust be, you know, really it, it's a matter of perspectives. And, and I absolutely agree with you that from that perspective, it, it can be confusing to people. But if you really focus on, okay, we're not trusting the packets and we have to continuously verify this stuff. I mean, Microsoft wants us to believe that it's impossible to do this, that it's impossible to audit the generation of shared access signature tokens. And OpenZD, obviously, as you know, can solve for these problems. So we know it's not impossible. Totally. We yeah. can absolutely yeah. do this. We just, you know, have to look at other people's solutions and look in other directions. Very cool. Uh, so, uh, You'd mentioned the term trusted identity. I'm going to actually pay attention to that now. I'm going to see if I, uh, when and where and how I use that term. So you've made me, you've made yeah. me question something. I love it. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, so that's cool. So um, when it comes to like uh, you know uh, the user experience so far, we talked about how you know plugging in things just worked. Uh, we uh, we haven't talked about the fact that uh, OpenZD ships with a UI, which I think is uh, interesting. Like not a lot of open. I mean, I won't say not a lot, but lots of complicated open source projects don't ship with the UI. True. Um, ha have Have you guys used the the ZD admin console at all? Yeah, that's what I would like to focus on quite a bit because we have a community of individuals who are just getting up to speed on the command line, and for them, a nice end user experience is going to make or break you know their success yeah. in this so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i've been i've been focusing on the self-hosted version and trying not to spend too much time in in the cloud zd because it's it's actually a different experience it's more robust there, there's a lot more going on there um to improve the end user experience but as we're focusing on a lot of self-hosting infrastructure that that's where a lot of my time has been spent recently and in general, has the Zach, the ZD admin console, been pretty uh, useful, pretty easy to navigate? Uh, has it has it solved that particular um, problem, or are there things that uh, that have stuck out at you that were like difficult? Uh, so, a couple of typos, not a big deal there. Obviously, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that if that was the worst case scenario, right, that would wouldn't be a big deal. But otherwise. Um, I feel like the biggest thing it's missing where a lot of uh, GUIs get it right nowadays is where when you first get in there, it recognizes that this is your first time in this interface and it tries to point you to, hey, check this out, you know, go guided here, tour kind of thing. Click. Yeah, you mm -hmm. got to click got it. You know, I understand. And it can be annoying if it's not your first time getting in there. But <laughs> if, it, if it is your first time, like it would be fantastic if that was enabled in there to say, hey, this is this is where you go set up your identities you know this like essentially mm -hmm. taking all of the information that you've developed and produced on open zd tv oh, and, sure. and mm -hmm. taking the best of that and creating uh, a hand holding experience through zach the you know the admin, the admin console for zd mm -hmm. and saying you know go here and, and pointing end users in the right direction mm -hmm. this is where you start this is what you got to do next and this is what this you know term means and and why it's important and then you know going all the way through even to, into where i feel like it lacks the most is in service configuration once it gets into service configuration you really got to know your your zd terminology and mm -hmm. you know identities for for sure and and how all that works and a lot of that stuff is actually um i would say has, has changed over the past year as of course you know mm -hmm. uh and I think it's important that you got to focus on going back to the change log. And, and a lot of these for a developer, somebody who's in this stuff technically a lot, it's not a big deal. But for newcomers to lower that barrier, these are some of the things that I think can really help them out to improve on that. No, that's cool. Right. Uh, what, what are there? So let's, uh, how about NATO, Laura? Any comments on this? Have you guys used the Zach at all? Uh, I have a little bit, yeah. And I, I, you know, I think a lot of the same things Joe has to say. Uh, it does make a huge difference to have the the ui because it's it's just like you say it's not not everything has something that's not just terminal only yeah and uh you know a lot of our more advanced users can use stuff but you know what i've run into is just a lot of people even if they have a lot of say like networking experience or some of these other experiences they have a lot of experience with like windows and using like the uis and the guis and all those things and so I think that's valuable. And then I agree, like it would be nice to have like a, a guided thing. Uh, aside from stuff like that, I think it's worked uh, really well. I think it's easy to help people visualize things since it does have that visual showing like, okay, you set up this thing. Well, I don't know. I can't tell if it's working. You're like when people can't like click on menus, I, like you get like all these panicky messages in the DMs where they're like, this thing doesn't work. This thing doesn't work. And it's like, have, have you have you gone and, and entered the commands? They're yeah. like, what commands? Well, you don't have as much of that with this stuff. Um, and it's, it's much easier to take a lot of the heavy lifting for like the configuration, say like off of the like more beginner users. Um, so it's, 
it's it's been interesting it's it's made a much easier way to also like introduce people to like this concepts and the skills because it, it can be really expensive and otherwise complicated to like help people understand concepts in the first place so right. we've built a system that kind of makes it to where like people at any level like if they're just trying to learn the concepts to learn enough to go get a job they can come in and start tinkering with you know the the little projects we have look at what other people have been doing and then ask questions um and then Mm -hmm. because i think i ran into when i was starting in my career like i didn't have people to talk to and you have unlimited trainings out there there's like unlimited things to google (laughs) unlimited youtube videos unlimited everything like i mean you can come watch zdtv to learn more of the stuff (laughs) but then like where do you go where you can just like get access to the same stuff that they use at businesses that that real business owners are using. And like people who are like, it's it's not just people like Joe, but it's like, we have other people who come from working with military. We actually have a lot of military. Yeah. We have a lot of vets. Yeah. A lot of vets. Uh, And then we have, you know, just different people at different backgrounds who can answer different kinds of questions. Uh, And so like, that with ZD, it fits really well into that universe of like people who are going from like zero to like at- capable. Like, I think it, it really makes like the networking side of that. It's a, it's one of the easier things for someone to pick up some skills and then go into an enterprise and be like, Oh, I've used open ZD. Then people are like, right. Oh. How do you, how do you securely get access to a remote location? I got just the ticket for you. Yeah, that's right. Secure um, an API. Secure oh, yes. APIs, yeah. I, exactly. I mean, that is that is that is what OpenZD is really focusing on to trying to bring to the world. I think that is one of the most important differentiating pieces of OpenZD mm-hmm. is the SDK first approach, the okay. idea of of listening on the overlay network and not on the yep. underlay network, a server that has no ports that are attackable. Like that's to me, that's mind blowing. Like that's Take it dark. Yeah, take a dark. That's that's that stuff is uh, really interesting, and it does it does take a minute for somebody to really understand what does that actually what is that actually going to buy me? Once you get oh, it yeah. though, you're like, wow, that's super neat stuff. Yeah. So, um, the the community that you're talking about is that some place on the internet? Can people just go there and join it, or is it a? Uh, yeah, um, that's our, our the DevSecOps Dojo. You can find that on our website, cloudunderground.dev. And uh, yeah, it's it's free to join. It's a Discord community, uh, and we're all there. Joe's there, uh, and we do a lot of our open source development with community members through our Discord server. Um, it's kind of how our company came to be in the first place. So <laughs> our our culture is very like all the engineering we do is just out there in the open community. We we open source all of it, and then uh, Laura and I are the ones who spend most of the time figuring out like. Like, how can we afford different goals? What are we going to try to come up with to, like, add to the resources and things like that? So we're always just looking for ways to, like, add to the engineering community. Uh, so we just, yeah, we just do all of our develop. It's, a, it's probably, people ask me all the time, well, how do you guys actually, like, make money and stuff? We actually pretty much, we have this weird philosophy of, like, charge for the labor and the people and then the tools like people need that stuff anyways and people are going to need servers and all these other things anyways and then also like we do teach a lot and so like how is it going to be easier for us to teach if even we have to do with a lot of licensing overhead and we're getting questions that we can't vet and stuff like that then it's easier for me to just be like like i'm too busy fundraising but look this stuff is free and you can use and you can join this community and then all of a sudden it's like i get my time back too so actually it pays for itself in, in in the time saving so because people always ask, well, how do you guys keep it running? <laughs> so you, it said running it's a, well. <laughs> you said it's open source. Where can somebody find the, the open source stuff? Is it on GitHub? Is it on GitLab? Where is it at? It is on GitHub. And uh, if you go to GitHub and look up the Underground Nexus from Underground Ops, or if you go to our website, cloudunderground.dev, you'll see there's a... Yeah, there's an open for... source tab on there, and you can uh, find that there. There's also a just tab on the website for the DevSecOps Dojo as well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right here? Yep, yep. open source. And then you can uh, go to the Underground Nexus page. Yeah, the t- Underground yeah. Nexus. Yep, and that kind of gives an explainer about what the Underground Nexus is, and you can find a link to our GitHub right there. Right there, cool. Yeah. Nice. Mm-hmm. I'll, I will make sure to add this into the descriptions at the end or into the uh, video. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. 
you you can what? toss an edge router out there and then connect all your nexuses to your zd edge router and just have one well <laughs> well it, i mean why why aren't we doing that right now we should have done that right now we should, we, I, I wish i wish i would have thought about that jeez that would have been, that would have been a that would have been a nice yeah. that would have oh, been a man. good demo yeah we'll have to make some I mean, sweet demos <laughs> You, I, I will. We'll, we'll have you back. It. Let's, let's, yeah. yeah, let's see it. I want to see. Yeah, definitely. I love to see. Yeah, it's, it's definitely the plan for a follow up. We're, we're working on those uh, as we speak. Actually, totally. Very cool. Very neat. Uh, so let's see. I don't know. We're at uh, 30, 30 minutes past the hour here. Um, what about uh, like some of the? Do you guys have any questions that you wanted to ask me? How about that? Like I like I always like turning it around, <laughs> oh, yeah. seeing, seeing if you guys have a question for me or for the us. So I guess for, for you guys, what were some of the things that led to, okay, so we're going to, the, the networking and the open, like the zero trust stuff, like what led to that being such a core focus uh, above, because networking such a large, large, I guess, realm of things, because I come from network engineering. And when I was doing network engineering, it's like you have not just encryption, not just like the networking models, uh, but like what brought you guys to like zero trust and building edge overlays. Yeah. So, uh, Galil Zeno, the CEO of NetFoundry, uh, he has also spent a long time in the networking space and, uh, he was working for uh, a relatively large networking based company and saw that, uh, network security is a tremendous challenge. And then on top of that, um, it was, you know, I'm probably like eight years ago, uh, building MPLS connections just takes forever, you know, building your bespoke, building an actual private network. It, it is glacial how slow <laughs> it is to actually build a private network. And he's like, there's gotta be something better than this. And so he looked around and he, he found this one piece of technology that was similar to OpenZD, but, uh, from a different, uh, company and, you know, built a nice little business on that. And then, uh, at some point decided, Hey, you know, if we're, we really are bought in on this whole open, the, on this whole zero trust adventure, it really is the future. Uh, you look around like the adage is not, it's, you know, it's not if you get hacked, it's when you get hacked. Right. So with that mindset, we, we really need something for the future. And that kind of led him down to the whole idea of, you know, how are we going to advance zero trust? And it's something that, uh, I think most of the people who work here, find it interesting and exciting. And so uh, open sourcing the software is also a, a no brainer, right? F for us anyway, because uh, it's difficult to put trust into something that you particularly can't verify. And so having this source out in the open allows anybody who is so interested to go and actually take the code and check it out and scan it and do those sorts of things. And, you know, we will obviously do that on our own the best we can. Uh, but if there's somebody out there who wants to even go go further, they can. We've had some people on ZDTV who are researchers doing interesting research stuff with OpenZD, and really it's about fostering that innovation. Um, I think I think Kurt was the fella that's attributed to saying the words, we want to cover the world a foot deep in ZD, right? <laughs> and so uh, having it be an open source is just, it, it's just the way that that, that will happen. And then as far as zero trust goes, um, you know, like in 2015, it was a term that very few people knew. Uh, and, and it was just very clearly a, uh, a need that was coming with all of the hyper-connected world, the internet, all this stuff that was happening. It just, it just made sense. So I wasn't there at the original founding, but, uh, that's my recollection and my relaying of what I know from, from the past. And so, yeah, it's, uh, Definitely having it in the open, I think, is um, real, a really good decision. I think that makes a lot of sense because it, it brings us back to a lot of what I ran into early on when I was developing things, even like before I met Joe, that kind of relates to like what our early conversations was like, um, it is a really challenging thing or maybe not challenging if you've done it a lot, but maybe time consuming regardless of how much time you spend building private networks. So like building private networks, it's like, okay, so we were trying to build private networks for people who like live across regions and things like that. And I had started doing some zero trust research in another lab that I had worked at a while back, but it's still kind of like one of those things where 
and you're working on things you're on your own you can only kind of figure out so much you can only get yeah. so far and i had discovered you know a, a lot more about containerization and, and the idea of like containerizing networks uh, and while that allowed us to come up with ways to like use overlays with say like Docker or build certain networks with Kubernetes, uh, you know, we came into like, okay, well, how can we like containerize specific private networks and then make it to where those networks will go from location to location. And then it's like, okay, well, do you build a VXLAN or do you set up a VPN? But then like, however it <laughs> handles the encryption type is not quite like a DMZ because you're losing transfer depending. I don't know, it's, it's a complicated thing. You have all these extra bits of overhead. And then if you're building with infrastructure as code, which is, we also had this idea of, I used to spend a lot of time building the exact same configuration for clients over and over and over, like forever. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that's like the name, that's what a job is. You go and you do the same thing yeah. a lot. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I not do these same configurations over and over? So I'm like, let's toss all of that in a container. And so it's like, by the time we finally had all these configurations that I'm building at like business after business after business in a container, it's like, okay, well, it's still really hard to pull off the distributed thing. It's like, well, okay, well, we're using a VPN still. And then all of a sudden ZD, we see ZD. And it's like, oh, so like the idea of like Docker's little overlay where it has this API system where if you at least cluster a bunch of Docker nodes, the Docker overlay system was the closest I found to, aside from like adding something like eBPF with Kubernetes clusters and Cilium or something like that, which we also tried and used. We've, we've tried yep. like all of it. So we've done the eBPF, Cilium configurations, the, that format. We've done the VPN formats. And then ZD, it's just, why don't you just take just the over? Why don't you just get rid of all this other confusion and stuff? Why don't you just let's say, here's your network. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all things SDN, right? Software defined networking. Oh my goodness, it's so much easier. Like, like it's it's a game changer. <laughs> it's oh, so man. much easier. It, re it really is. <laughs> it, it really. And anybody who's ever tried to do that, you, you, as soon as you build your first overlay with OpenZD, you're like, man, that was so much easier, and yeah. and, and uh, you know, incredibly secure. So you know, it's not it's not giving up on any security either. So that's that's always important. Well, cool. Um, it's forty minutes we've been talking. I imagine we could just keep talking forever is there uh is, is so um is there anything on the way out here uh anything that you guys want to mention in passing or uh is there something that uh, you think we should be doing differently what's our what's our final thoughts i mean i guess my final thoughts are, are mostly you know like i think networking has changed and i think it's time for people to consider adopting some of these changes and, and realize like you can save it's not just a matter of saving a lot of sanity and confusion and making training easier like it saves time it saves frustration yeah like you can you can just skip days months months of configurations and just start working with stuff you, like you no longer have to spend all this time configuring a data center and its environment you don't have to spend all this time configuring the networking the same way like you used to. You can just get a, a, the right system, automate all the infrastructure on it, and then just to start getting to work. So, anyways, I think that's a, an incredible thing that like. And, and it's only the start of your journey on Zero Trust too. Then you can start talking about all the extra security features you can add in once you have deployed that overlay network, right? Like that's the totally. start. That that is the baseline, and then there's the the rest of the glacier that's under the water for things like continuous authorizations, uh, MFA type stuff, and those sorts of things too. So, Joe, Absolutely. what about you? Uh, what what kind of final thoughts do you have? Well, I would say, I'd put it like this, in practice with Zero Trust Strategy, uh, I'd like to reiterate that, you know, we trust, we should continue to work on trusting people and not trusting their digital packets. Like when we onboard users, focus on business outcomes designed from the inside out. Uh, don't trust that user systems will make connections to safe systems. Don't trust yeah. their identities with more privileges then they need to deliver their intended results. Uh, don't trust their packets. So inspect and log all traffic. Um, these are the <clears throat> four design principles of the zero trust strategy. So that's something that if I could leave people with, that's really the focus here is, you know, having a strategy for breach prevention and zero trust is that strategy. Love it. 
Love it. Well, great. I mean, I have very much enjoyed this conversation. It's so cool to hear you guys are building OpenZD into like little devices. That's really neat. I'm looking forward to whatever promotions you guys have about that. Like I want to see, uh, you know, the marketing material. I'm looking forward to these cool demos. Happy to have you guys back on. Happy to try it out too. Like we can do it right from here. It's one of one of my yeah, favorite uh, type of one of my favorite types of things is saying, you know, like uh, you know, oh, you want to get access to this thing that's here on my laptop? Well, let's do that right here. Boom, boom, right? And it takes you know minutes. So totally. uh, I'll look, oh, I'll look forward. I look forward to all of that. It sounds great. Appreciate so much, uh, Joe, for showing up. Nato and Laura, really appreciate it. Had a great ZDTV. I hope it was good for you guys too. And uh, we'll see you guys, everybody next time. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me.